Hi there, my name is Vic Vieira. I'm an ENT consultant working for the NHS in central London. And today I'm going to start a series of videos which will be all about the topic of globus sensation. A globus sensation essentially means a feeling of something being in the throat. And that means an awful lot of things to different people. So some people would say that a globus sensation is a feeling of a lump in their throat or pressure or fullness in their throat. Some people feel it all the time. Some people feel it only when they're swallowing or eating something. On the other hand, some people might say that they feel not a lump in their throat, but feeling of some like sort of mucus or something that they need to <coughs> sort of cough up or clear their throat to get rid of. And some other people may say that it interferes with their swallowing in some way. So some people would say that when they eat something, they feel it seems to go down very slowly at a certain point in their throat, like a slow transit. Occasionally when this gets really severe, they feel like everything tightens up and, and they can't eat or drink or swallow or talk at all. And often we'd call that laryngospasm in the medical profession, but it all seems to come under the same umbrella. Now, because I'm an ears, nose and throat surgeon, we see an awful lot of people with this globus sensation because it's a feeling of something in the throat. So the reason why I've made this into three separate videos is because there's an awful lot of information to talk about. And I've left an awful lot out as well. So what I've done is I've made uh, some emails that I can send out to you, which will give you more information about each of the conditions that I'll be talking about. On top of that, a good friend of mine, Mr. Kieran Germani, who's an excellent ENT surgeon, has very kindly written a book and he's allowed me to give this book away to you for free. Again, if you sign up for the email newsletter below. Once you've got the book, if that's all you want, that's fine. You can just unsubscribe and that'll be the end of it. So one of the most common diagnoses given to people with a globus sensation is gastroesophageal reflux disease or heartburn or indigestion. In, in England, we call it G-O-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disease, but I think they put an E in it in America because they don't use O's there. And I think this makes complete sense because if you imagine lots of acid coming up, making a burning sensation here, it gets all the way into your throat. You cause burning in that area here, which causes inflammation, fullness, and it feels like there's a lump in your throat. Now, my problem with this is that a, a lot of people know what indigestion is and they just go out to their local chemist and pick up some antacids or, or something known as PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. So the lansoprazole, emeprazole, isomeprazole, you know, all those little drugs out there. Uh, and that normally sorts that problem out. But an awful lot of people who take those drugs still say afterwards, well, I've got rid of the burning sensation, but I still have this lump in my throat. I, personally, I'm not a great fan of using that diagnosis. I don't think it really fits in. But then some people start talking about something known as LPR or laryngopharyngeal reflux, which in my mind is just gastroesophageal reflux is just between here and in your stomach. And LPR is laryngopharyngeal reflux, which means voice box and your throat. It just seems like an extension of acid coming all the way up to here. That sort of sounds like the same thing, but I think the definition is not very good here. Personally, I like to think of it in two separate things because a feeling of acid coming up, I think a lot of people understand, but we believe that a global sensation is not really caused by acid, but a combination of acid and something known as pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme made in your stomach, and this enzyme, when you eat something, breaks up meat or protein into little pieces so we can easily digest it. So the idea behind pepsin is that although you may be taking some Zol drugs like uh, lansoprazole, meprazole, all those sorts of things that gets rid of the acid and gets rid of the burning sensation, if sort of stomach contents or stomach juice is coming all the way into your throat, it still has pepsin in it, this enzyme. And this enzyme, as I said, breaks down meat. And if it gets into your throat, the most delicate part of your throat is your voice box, this delicate little creature that comes and closes, open and closes and provides voice. Now, if an enzyme sits on your voice box, it starts swelling up and that swelling is, is triggered by your mind. You just think, oh my God, my voice box is swelling up because our brains are very hardwired into worrying about anything happening to your voice box because it's a very narrow part of our airway. And if even a you know, millimeter were to swell up in that area, your brain suddenly starts thinking that you're choking. So a slight inflammation there makes it feel like there's a lump in your throat and makes people worried. So an awful lot of people will start <clears throat> and they might feel it like a bit of mucus in their throat and they're trying to cough it up when they're actually is just trying to cough up their own voice box, which is never going to work. And sometimes people get a cough at night, a nocturnal dry cough, because we believe that if you're lying down flat, then there's no effect of gravity keeping the sort of gastric juice down in your stomach. And when you're lying down, it all sort of sloshes up your esophagus and spreads all over the back of your throat. And we do know that pepsin can come up in a burp. So because every time you eat something, that food goes down and displaces some of the air that's in your stomach. That air comes up in a tiny burp that most people don't even perceive. The pepsin enzyme therefore can come all the way up into your esophagus, into your throat, and end up in your nose and also into your middle ear as well through the eustachian tube. I've already talked about the things that happen when it goes into your voice box, but when it gets to your nose, it can cause a rhinitis. You tend to see a lot of sort of 
white sort of swelling at the back of the turbinates. And so some people think that uh, this inflammation at the back of your nose can cause a post-nasal drip or a catarrh sensation. You feel like it's dripping down the back of their throat. Now, often we can quite clearly see this pepsin damage because as an ENT surgeon, we use something known as a flexible nasendoscopy. That's a telescope that goes up your nose and looks down the back of your throat. If you want to have a bit of a laugh, you can see me in this video doing this on myself so you can see my own voice box, which is relatively normal. But in some people who have a globus sensation, which we believe is caused by LPR or, or acid or a pepsin enzyme damage to the voice box, you can see at the back of the voice box, the whole area there is very swollen because that's the area very close to the esophagus or the gullet that runs from your throat to your stomach. And in my mind's eye, I'd see the enzyme coming over and spilling over the back of the voice box. And there are some terms that we doctors use like interarotoma pachyderma or mucosal stranding, all these sorts of things you might be able to see in this picture over here. So the swelling at the back of the voice box is what we believe is sometimes causing a feeling of a lump in the throat or a globus sensation. But we believe there's another reason why people with this condition, this acid and pepsin problem, can cause a lump in the throat. And that's caused by another sphincter in the esophagus that not many people know about. So an awful lot of people know about the esophageal sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus between the stomach and the esophagus. But there is actually another sphincter right at the top between your esophagus and your throat. And this is a ring of muscle called the cricopharyngeus muscle, which squeezes at the top and it stops contents from your esophagus from going up into your throat. So some of you may know about a hiatus hernia, which is when the stomach goes through that sphincter at the bottom and ends up slightly in the chest. In this situation, stomach contents can come all the way up the esophagus. And it's the job of this sphincter at the top, the cricopharyngeus muscle, to stop all this juice from coming up into your throat. So it's almost like a second line of defense and it works very well. But the problem is, if that's there all the time and it's constantly trying to stop all this stuff from coming up, it can cause problems because this muscle gets obviously a little bit more spasmed and it's holding on very tightly. And it can feel like everything's a bit restricted. With this muscle being tight for so long, it causes a spasm in that area and it doesn't release very easily. One good example of this is when sometimes when acid's coming up and the sphincter is very, very tight and then you decide to start eating. Now this sphincter gets into a bit of trouble because it's trying to keep the stomach contents from coming up, but also there's food coming down the other way and it's sort of stuck in the middle. And so what we believe happens is that uh, the body gets very scared because there's food in the throat waiting to go down and the sphincter isn't opening very quickly and then it, the brain worries that all this food is going to end up going down the voice box into your lungs which is going to cause a terrible pneumonia so everything clams up and you get something known as a laryngospasm everything tightens up you feel like you're choking you can't speak and it's very very frightening Eventually everything relaxes typically and everything goes down the right way. But the problem is it's a really scary event and, and our brains worry about this and it makes this sphincter even more tight because it, the, the worry makes this worse. Another clue for us to think that the cricopharyngeus, the sphincter muscle, is causing some of these globus sensations is that sometimes when we see people we go, look, I really think we ought to be looking down there whilst you're asleep to make sure there's nothing more serious going on in there. And then in a short 10, 15 minute operation, we put a tube down the throat while someone's asleep called a rigid esophagoscopy. And we look down the esophagus and see if there's anything going on there. And often we look there and there's nothing there. And I, I, we pull out the tube and we, we go to the patient after and say, look, good news is we couldn't find anything serious. I'm sorry, I can't work out what's going on. And then the patient turns around to you and says, well, I don't know what you did in there, but it feels great. I feel fantastic. My feeling of lump is gone. And we haven't done anything. All we've done is had a look. And some people have postulated that perhaps we've stretched this muscle and reduced some of the spasm and that feeling of a lump suddenly goes away. Now, the problem with that is that it doesn't really cure the problem. So after a few months, some people tend to come back and say, look, actually, can you just do that test again? I know there's nothing in there, but I just want you to stretch it again because it feels so much better afterwards. Anyway, hopefully from that, you'll understand why a lot of doctors believe that this acid and pepsin problem can lead to symptoms causing globus sensation. So the standard treatment for this LPR problem is to look at acid and pepsin together. Now, we often give people proton pump inhibitors, so lansoprazole, omeprazole, isomeprazole, all those sorts of things, and it sorts out the acid side of it. It actually does ever so slightly help the pepsin side, uh, only because it's a little bit more complex than what I said before. So um, pepsin is made firstly as something known as pepsinogen, which is like a pro-enzyme, and it gets activated with acid around it. And that acid converts it into the active form of the enzyme called pepsin. So giving things like lansoprazole and these proton pump inhibitors 
can reduce the, uh, the activity of this enzyme, but not by very much because by the time it ends up in your throat and then you have a cup of tea, some alcohol, some fruit, anything like that, it'll just activate that enzyme again. And so it's not particularly useful. But we do know that using these drugs can speed up the therapy, to speed up the resolution of these uh, issues. But what the mainstay of treatment for LPR or this uh, pepsin problem is to use something known as Gaviscon Advance. Now, this is very common in England, but for some reason you can't get this in America and some other countries around the world. Gaviscon Advance is for a feeling of a lump in your throat, whereas all the other Gaviscons are for heartburn. And we're already covering that with those, uh, covering that with those Zol drugs. So I really want to make that distinction clear. Gaviscon Extra, Gaviscon Double Strength, Gaviscon Weapons Grade, all of those are for heartburn, whereas Gaviscon Advanced is for a feeling of a lump in your throat. And it's readily available over the counter in England uh, or in the UK, but for some reason it's not available in, in America. Apparently you can get it with, by some Amazon associate people, and I'll try and leave a link to one of those people in the video description below. So the way that Gaviscon Advance works is that you take a tablespoon of this stuff after every meal or snack or anything that's more exciting than a glass of water. And the way it works is that you put this into your mouth within 30 minutes of any meal. It goes down the back of your throat and neutralizes, it sort of neutralizes all the pepsin there and then goes down your esophagus and sits on top of the meal that you've just had. Once it enters your stomach, it turns into this sort of foamy layer so that if you do burp, which everyone does after a meal, that uh, pepsin that ends up coming up in that burp is neutralized on the way up through this foamy layer that this Gaviscon Advance makes. So you have to take the Gaviscon Advance a tablespoon or 10 mils after every meal, every snack, every cup of tea with a, with a biscuit. Now, the other thing you should do is take it just before you go to bed, because as I said before, when you're lying down, there's no gravity keeping this stuff down and it ends up sloshing up. So it keeps that sort of sensation at the back of your throat, particularly if you have problems at night, it helps those things as well. Now, the problem is that these symptoms don't go away instantly. And I sometimes explain this to patients by saying, look, if I poured sort of meat eating enzymes and acid on the back of your hand for three months and then stopped one day, it'll still be red and raw and, and you won't like it. It takes about four to six weeks for things to start feeling an awful lot better. So you must keep taking the medication for at least four to six weeks before most people start noticing a difference. We give the proton pump inhibitors because it speeds up that process ever so slightly. But the, the other problem with those tablets is I don't really like giving that for a very long time. So I like people to only use it for about three to four weeks or less if possible until they start feeling a little bit better. Because I find that in some of my patients, when they take those drugs, uh, lansoprazole, meprazole, things like that for too long, as soon as they stop it, they get these terrible rebound effects. And I just don't like that sensation of people being sort of stuck on a drug forever. Anyway, so you, you take those proton pump inhibitors for a few weeks and, and try and cut, wean it off as quickly as possible. But you keep going with a Gaviscon Advance. And it's quite relatively safe because it sort of passes right through. You don't really absorb it. And you keep going with the Gaviscon Advance until you start feeling it start things starting to feel a little bit better with your symptoms, like feeling the lump in your throat and <clears throat> those sorts of sensations. Once it's got what you think is completely better, you feel completely normal, then I think you should take it for an extra two weeks and then wean yourself off. Because an awful lot of people, when they have this condition, they've had it for such a long time, they've forgotten what normal is. And it's, it's sometimes hard to be absolutely certain. So you keep going with the Gaviscon Advance until you feel normal, can carry, carry on for another two weeks and then wean yourself off. And then once you come off it altogether, Hopefully you'll be fine and that'll be the end of it. I say hopefully because it doesn't always work that way. When you've had a global sensation or acid reflux in the past, you'll find that symptoms sort of come and go. So some months are good, some months are bad. And you might notice that it comes back again, maybe after a Christmas dinner or something like that. And if you start, as soon as you feel that sensation on that day or that hour, you feel that feeling of a lump in your throat, you should think to yourself, right, I remember this. I took two, three months of Gaviscon Advance till I got rid of it last time. I'm not going to let that happen again. You take one big tablespoon of this stuff, go to bed or whatever you're going to do at that point. And then often the next day, you're fine. You don't need to take another sort of 
three, four months of this this horrible taste in syrup anymore. So you sort of nip it in the bud before it becomes an issue. So a lot of my patients have had this problem. They've taken it for three, maybe four months. They've got rid of the problem. They feel completely normal. And then maybe three, four months later, they get it again. I tell them to take a, a spoon of this stuff or maybe for a day they take the syrup. An awful lot of people are taking maybe three, four spoons of Gaviscon Advance per year just to keep things at bay. And I think most people think that's manageable and it keeps this problem out of the way and it stops it becoming a thing that they have to deal with every moment of the day. Now, I've tried very hard to explain that in a simple sort of format, but as you can imagine, uh, with so many people having this issue, it's a lot more complicated than that. And that's where my friend Kieran Germani, who's written a book on silent reflux or whatever you want to call it, uh, he's written that book. So as I said before, please use the uh, link in the video description below to join the newsletter. The first email that comes out to you will have this free book attached to it. And if you don't want to see any of the other emails, you can just unsubscribe and that's no problem. It's completely free. Don't worry about it. There is a problem, however, of blaming everything on LPR because an awful lot of people who've come to see us doctors say that, actually, no, I've already taken proton pump inhibitors and I've taken Gaviscon Advance for six months. It's made no difference at all. What else could be going on? So the rest of this video and the other two videos will be talking about all the other conditions that can cause a feeling of a lump in your throat. So the next one in this video, we'll be talking about something known as cervical heterotopic gastric mucosa, which is a grand name, which basically means little patches of stomach lining at the top of your esophagus, just near your throat. Now, normally you'd see esophageal lining, but then you get these patches of what look like stomach cells sitting at the back of your throat. And often we wonder how they got there. And we, there's lots of theories about that. And I've talked about that in my emails. But these patches of sort of stomach lining up here continue to make acid, they continue to make pepsin, which is very close to your throat and also causes a bit of constriction because right near that uh, uh, cricopharyngeus muscle. And we believe somehow that this causes a feeling of a lump in the throat. And we believe this because there have been trials out there that when they see this problem, these patches, inlet patches at the, at the top of the esophagus, people have ablated them or reduced them with lasers or radiofrequency ablation, things like that. And actually afterwards, people felt an awful lot better. They felt that their feeling of lump in the throat got better. Now there's an awful lot more information about islet patches or you know, this heterotopic gastric mucosa problem at the top of the esophagus. And there's research in there, but it's a bit too much for this video. So I am thinking on top of the video, uh, the, the emails I'm sending out and this book that uh, my friend Kieran Germani is sending out, I'm thinking about setting up a, uh, a meeting for all the people who are more interested in all these other conditions that deal with, that cause a globus sensation. And the idea is that I rent out a room somewhere in London and that myself, Kieran Germani, and a whole bunch of other experts that deal with a globus sensation can talk to people and explain all the different reasons why they may have a feeling of a lump in their throat. There is yet another condition related to cricopharyngeus, that ring, uh, that the upper esophageal sphincter, which is known as a pharyngeal pouch. Now this is slightly different and it's, it has slightly different symptoms are related to it. With this sphincter being very tight, occasionally it causes an awful lot of pressure just above it to the side where there's a weakness in the throat or a weakness in the wall of the throat. And what tends to happen is that food can push through that weakness and make an outpouching. It looks like a diverticular, big sort of pouch that comes out the side. It's very hard to see, obviously, looking at the side because it comes out here. But you can see it if you do something known as a barium swallow. It's not really called a barium swallow anymore. But basically, you swallow some dye. It goes down your throat and fills up this pouch on the side here. And you can see it with these sort of X-ray photographs that go on. Now, there are two main ways to get rid of pharyngeal pouches. Uh, the old method is where we make a little cut over here, open up the neck, cut out this pouch and st stitch it up. But we always used to just cut through that muscle because we knew if we opened up that muscle, it wouldn't happen again. Slightly more common these days is that we actually go through the mouth and we staple it open so it stops it from closing up again. But you have to remember that we also cut through that cricopharyngeus muscle, again opening up that area to stop this problem. If you do have a pharyngeal patch, a lot of times people think that after they've eaten, they feel like it's sort of gurgling and they feel like there's a lump in their throat. And then maybe hours later, they find that food ends up coming up. It's undigested food. And you go, oh God, I ate this pie ages ago. How is it coming up now? So that sort of sensation of feeling like something's there is often apparent in people with pharyngeal pouches. Now, all the conditions I've talked about in this video have been related to acid, pepsin, the cricopharyngeus muscle, all causing globus. Now, these are very common things that cause globus, 
But there are an awful lot of people out there who've had all this treatment, have not got any better. There's even a trial called the Toppets trial, which was done in a hospital up north where I used to work at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. And this trial showed that in people with persistent problems, who've had this problem for a long time, of sort of unusual throat symptoms or globus sensation, giving six weeks of high dose Zol drugs or these, uh, these um, proton pump inhibitors, didn't seem to help their feeling of a lump in their throat at all. Now, personally, I think this makes sense, and I've mentioned this before. Uh, a, I don't think that proton pump inhibitors work very well for the PEPs inside of it, although it does reduce the sort of conversion between the pro-enzyme to the active enzyme. But secondly, I think, as I said at the start, a lot of people already know what acid reflux is, and they normally sort that out before they spend months on the waiting list to see a doctor. So by the time they see a doctor, they, they say, actually, no, I've tried all of these things. What else could be going on? And that's what I'll be talking about in the next two videos. And I'll be breaking them up into little things. I'll be particularly talking about things that are related to me because I deal with snoring and sleep apnea quite a lot. And there are lots of conditions that from snoring and sleep apnea that cause problems with a lump in the throat. So please look out for that video. That will be coming out soon and I'll try and do the footage as soon as possible. But before you go, please remember that you can sign up to those emails, get that free book, get those free emails and if you are interested in this course idea that I have and you'd like to come down to London and speak to me and some other consultants and, and we talk uh, in one-to-one -one sessions and also in, the, in a lecture type situation, I'd be really interested to see if anyone's interested. If you are, I'll set up this event and all the proceeds will go to a worthy charity. But let me know if that's something that interests you. you can, I think you can register your interest with those emails or you can send a, um, a comment in the, the link below and I'll try and make that available to you if, if that's what people want. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Do take care. Bye-bye.